Good evening and welcome to NTD News. I'm Stephanie Cox. Here are today's top stories. The Supreme Court is staying out of the dispute between former President Trump and the DOJ over the 100 documents with classified markings. But there's another legal battle Trump has yet to face. The January 6th committee held its final hearing of the year, and in a 9-0 vote, the panel has now subpoenaed former President Trump to testify. The Biden administration breathing life into a Trump-era rule to send illegal border crossers from Venezuela out of the U.S. and into Mexico, while opening a legal pathway for 24,000 Venezuelans to come to the U.S. U.S. inflation keeps soaring, and with it, the fastest price increases in 40 years. What an economist says could stabilize those prices. And a chaotic school board meeting in Michigan. The board members ended their meeting early after numerous parents started yelling, vote them out. Tens of thousands of Venezuelans are now provided a legal pathway to enter the U.S., and the DHS is using a Trump-era rule to return illegal crossers back to Mexico. However, the administration may expand the new legal pathway, which some experts say could attract many more through chain migration. Here's NTD's Melina Wise Cup with more details. Immigrants from Venezuela arriving at the southern border have surged over the past few months. Unique encounters totaled 15,500 in 2022, rising further to 33,000 in September. That's compared to a monthly average of just 127 unique Venezuelan encounters from 2014 to 2019. In an attempt to ease the strain at the southern border, the Biden administration is creating a new pathway for 24,000 Venezuelans to legally enter the U.S. But for those who come illegally, they will be returned to Mexico, reviving the Trump era's Title 42 rule. But this administration wants to get rid of Title 42. So if they put this policy in place, part of which is that this Title 42 expulsions will now apply to Venezuelans, but then they get rid of Title 42, let's say, several months from now, well, then all they've done is create this flow of legally admitting people who, uh, you know, are Venezuelan and usually people who have relatives here. That's how, it, that's how that would work. How much it will ease the strain is yet to be seen, as many who are weighing whether to cross illegally may continue to try. Even though they will be returning Venezuelans now under Title 42, there's possibility for waivers and exceptions. They actually said that. Well, guess what? Why not take your chance? This administration is a soft touch. The 100,000 Venezuelans already in the U.S. will be allowed to stay and seek asylum. The U.S. asylum system is currently grappling with a backlog. If you look at the big picture, the greatest problem with the U.S. system is that it doesn't make the distinction between migrants and refugees. The asylum system itself shouldn't be hijacked by uh, economic migrants. The DHS has also announced a historic 65,000 H-2B work visas will be available next year. Reporting in Washington, D.C., Melina Weiskup, NTD News. And the Biden administration is investigating Governor DeSantis for transporting illegal immigrants to Martha's Vineyard. The investigation is focused on the use of COVID relief funds for the relocation. Here's more. The Treasury Department opened an investigation into Florida Governor Ron DeSantis's flight of illegal immigrants to Martha's Vineyard. The department's inspector sent a letter to members of Congress announcing the investigation. The probe is part of a broader investigation into how states used billions of dollars sent to them under the American Rescue Plan. The letter states that the Treasury Department would review the allowability of COVID-19 aid to states related to immigration generally and will specifically confirm whether interest earned on the funds was utilized by Florida related to immigration activities, and if so, what conditions and limitations apply to such use. The letter came in response to several House members who wrote to the Treasury Department in September demanding an investigation. About 50 illegal immigrants from Venezuela were flown to Martha's Vineyard, and the Florida government took credit for it. 
Hours after the illegal aliens were sent to the island, the Massachusetts governor's office deployed the National Guard before sending the illegal immigrants to a military base on Cape Cod. Today, the Supreme Court denied former President Trump's request to intervene in the dispute over classified documents. All nine justices agreed with the decision. NTD's Arlene Richards reports. The Justice Department had a victory Thursday in the ongoing dispute over 100 documents marked classified that were seized from former President Trump's Florida residence. Trump asked the Supreme Court to review an appeals court ruling that blocked the special master from reviewing this set of documents. The higher court denied Trump's request, keeping the documents out of the hands of Judge Raymond Deary, the special master. The appeals court had reversed Judge Eileen Cannon's order authorizing the special master to review all of the seized documents, including those marked classified, and allowed the department to continue its review of the 100 documents in the criminal probe. Trump argued the appeals court lacked jurisdiction to review Cannon's order. Meanwhile, the Justice Department has appealed the appointment of the special master. In other court matters, New York Attorney General Letitia James filed a motion on Thursday asking a state court to block Trump from moving assets. The motion comes as part of a lawsuit James filed claiming Trump and his three adult children benefited from fraudulent transactions. She's concerned Trump will move assets out of New York to avoid potential liability. Arlene Richards, NTD News, New York. The January 6th committee today voted unanimously to subpoena former President Trump. J6 panel members accuse him of making false claims of a rigged election and betraying his oath of office. NTD's Jason Perry has that story. On Thursday, the J6 committee voted 9-0 to to subpoena former President Trump to testify before the panel. The subpoena will last until the end of this congressional term. And if Republicans take back Congress, some have already pledged to investigate the January 6th committee itself. They say the committee has lacked legitimacy from the start. After Speaker Nancy Pelosi rejected two of the Republicans nominated to serve on the January 6th panel. The vote to subpoena the former president came at the committee's final hearing of the year. So I say to you again, as I did in June, this investigation is not about politics. And Vice Chair Liz Cheney, who says she'll switch to the Democratic Party if former President Trump becomes the GOP nominee, added this. And the House has now passed a bill to amend the Electoral Count Act to help ensure that no other future plots to overturn an election can succeed. A large portion of the hearing was about what the committee called Trump's baseless claims of widespread voter fraud in the 2020 presidential election. In none of these 62 cases was President Trump able to establish any viable claims of election fraud sufficient to overturn the results of the election. They also played a clip from former Vice President Mike Pence, who some say should have rejected the electoral college votes from certain states. President Trump said I had the right to overturn the election. President Trump is wrong. And they played a video from former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, who commented on that very issue. The vice president made the certification and the litigation was complete. It was complete. But questions about the possibility of widespread election fraud continue. Conservative activist Dinesh D'Souza recently made a documentary called 2000 Mules. Using cell phone geo-tracking data and surveillance video, the documentary claims to show proof of widespread fraud in the swing states during the 2020 election. A Rasmussen poll found that 77 percent of likely U.S. voters who have seen 2000 Mules say the documentary strengthened their conviction that there was systematic and widespread voter fraud in the 2020 election. The January 6th committee is set to disband at the end of this congressional session unless lawmakers vote to reauthorize it next year. Jason Perry, NTD News. The White House has confirmed that it asked Saudi Arabia to delay oil production cuts by about two months, or after the U.S. midterms. OPEC announced the cut last week to keep demand and prices high. In a statement today, National Security Council spokesman John Kirby said the Biden administration asked the Saudis to delay the cut until after the next OPEC meeting. That's in early December. The delay would keep gas prices from going up before the U.S. midterms. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken says OPEC knew the move would help Russia's economy 
and that the U.S. is reviewing consequences for Saudi Arabia. The U.S. annual inflation rate came in at 8.2 percent in September, down from 8.3 percent in August. That's according to the latest data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. That makes it higher than the 8.1 percent that was expected. Earlier today, I spoke with Vance Ginn, the president of Ginn Economic Consulting and senior fellow at Young Americans for Liberty, for his perspective on this. Vance Ginn, welcome to our show. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you. Now, price inflation remains at a 40-year high. You've said that it's due to bad Fed policies. Could you elaborate on that? Well, over the last couple of years, the Federal Reserve has increased their balance sheet, which is the amount of money supply that's in circulation by about $5 trillion, just a massive amount of money that's been put into circulation to really finance a lot of the excessive spending by Congress, where they've run up the deficit by more than $6 trillion. And so a lot of that has been monetized, financed by the Federal Reserve. So what they did was they put a lot of money in the economy that kept interest rates at their target interest rate lower for a long period of time. And so what you expect is a boom, which we had, an artificial boom, and now you're going to see a bust. And unfortunately, a big part of that is higher and higher inflation that reduces the purchasing power of all Americans. And other than inducing a recession, is there any other way to escape this inflation situation? The key part here is for the Federal Reserve to start to cut their balance sheet. And right now they've been raising their target interest rate up to 3 to 3.25 percent right now. But, I mean, look, they haven't really reduced their balance sheet much at all. And that's the amount of liquidity, the amount of money supply floating throughout the economy. And so it goes into different places. It starts with those who have a lot lot of credit and then it trickles down. That may be the trickle down economics that goes through all of our other prices that we're seeing. We have a huge national debt. And if the Fed keeps raising rates, we'll have to pay even more interest on that debt. What's the risk to the federal budget here? The risk to the, the federal budget is, is pretty large because it starts to crowd out other areas that are key roles for government. And you may, we may have a, a discussion about what are those key roles. But if you think about securing the, um, securing, uh, the overall people's security overall, um, but you also look at a justice system for courts and contract law and things of that nature, you, know, you really want to focus on those areas. And instead, it crowds out other areas of the budget when you have to pay more interest on the national debt, which is expected to be about $550. $50 billion this year. And if interest rates keep going up, which they likely will, then you'll have even more money that will just be going to the national, you know, to go that, that interest on the national debt. And with national debt already over $31 trillion, which is about $250,000 per taxpayer, this is a huge cost that's making it even more difficult for Americans to be able to afford the everyday things that they're paying money for. Social Security benefits are set to get an 8.2 percent cost of living adjustment next year, a higher increase on average than those in the private sector. What concerns do you have here? Well, Social Security is based on the indexing of the consumer price index. And so whenever they we've had a pretty large increase in the consumer price index, which is up 8.2% you know, year over year, then you're going to see a large increase in Social Security payments to retirees. Um, and the issue is, is that Social Security is a pay-as-you-go system, meaning that the people who are working today are paying for current retirees. And the issue is, is that the current workers are not getting the same pay increase as these payments that are going to go out to retirees. So in other words, there's not as much money going in as as much money that's going out. And we already have a situation where Social Security um, could become insolvent within about a decade, meaning less money that's going to be paid out to retirees than what they were expecting. And this will make that even worse over time and put even more of a strain on the private sector as we're probably going to have more debt Uh, more inflation, and even uh, less growth in the economy. And workers ultimately are going to have fewer jobs available. So I think this is going to be good for retirees, but it's going to hurt the overall economy with more inflationary pressures. And what actions do you think the administration should take to ensure future generations can also access these benefits? I think we really need to look at, you know, privatizing a lot of Social Security, especially for those that are younger. They should have the option of whether they want to be in a defined benefit plan that's unlikely to make it over a long haul or have an account that they actually control. And I think that's a big part of this is having more control about your future, about your retirement. And that has not happened whenever government's in control, because then you become more dependent on their choices, like we've seen right now, to where we're seeing a situation where many people may not even get the benefits that they've thought to have been paid in for 
for such a long period of time. But I also think it's important for us to understand and educate people that Social Security is a pay-as-you-go system where it's not there's not an account that's in your name. It's paying for current retirees. And so we've really got to start to change and make it some key reforms so that there are opportunities for people to have key retirement as they get older and get into retirement. And so finally, how do you think the government could ease the burden on workers and retirees? Right now, I think there's an opportunity for spending restraint. Um, excessive government spending is the ultimate burden of government. And what we've seen is we've had a lot of excessive spending, a lot of a massive increase in the national debt to more than $31 trillion. And a lot of that's been monetized by the Federal Reserve, putting more money in the economy. And look, the Federal Reserve, um, that's their main way that they do things is try to stabilize the economy by throwing more money at it. And that creates more inflation. And unfortunately, it's a situation that can only be solved for the Federal Reserve to reduce the money supply in the economy. And they need to do it now. This is one reason why the Federal Reserve has become such a problem. And ultimately, at some point, I think we really need to end the Fed and make sure that we have more opportunities to prosper by the productive private sector and not by government directing resources across the economy. All right. Vance Ginn, president of Ginn Economic Consulting, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Have a great day. President Biden today noted that there are indicators of progress in the latest inflation numbers, though the Fed is expected to raise interest rates again. And a jury recommends life in prison without parole for the Parkland school shooter. He pleaded guilty to 17 murders and 17 attempted murders during the 2018 shooting in Florida. In Florida, the death penalty is only enacted if the jury unanimously agrees. They had to decide if the murders were particularly cruel or were cold and premeditated and not outweighed by mitigating factors. The prosecutor said that the shooting was a systematic massacre and pointed to social media posts from the gunmen showing prior planning and insensitivity to the suffering of the victims and their families. The defense team said the shooter has fetal alcohol spectrum disorder affecting his development and behavior. Nine jurors voted for the death penalty, while three voted for life imprisonment without parole. A school board meeting in Michigan ended early after parents started protesting loudly. They said they're opposed to sexually explicit content in books that the district makes available to kids. Michigan's third largest school district, Dearborn Public Schools, held a board meeting on Monday. This clip surfaced on the internet of religious parents, mostly Muslims and some Christians, attending the meeting. They were protesting the sexually explicit content in the LGBTQ books the district makes available to students. After an hour, commenters were told that they had only limited time to speak before the board, and then that people had to clear the room because the crowded conditions violated the fire code. We're going to ask everyone to step outside. You can stay on the property. Everyone has an iPhone. You go on YouTube. You, guys, what? Hey, hey, what's that? After this, people started a chant to vote out the board members. NTD spoke with Stacy Langton, who's experienced in dealing with school boards and trying to get books with sexually explicit content removed. She applauds how many people showed up at the meeting. You know, it should be that way every time at every meeting. There should be at least 100 people who are very angry because the issue isn't going away. The Detroit Free Press reports that the school district has so far removed six books for review, most of which were LGBTQ themed. Langton says that's only a first step. Well, the review process is just that. It's a review. It's not a guarantee that they're going to take the books out. And I found that out the hard way last November because the first two books that I challenged and asked to be reviewed, they returned them to the shelves. The board meeting ended early and is reportedly scheduled to continue on Thursday night at a larger school so more people can attend. Reporting by Arian Pastar, NTD News. Coming up, hip-hop artist Kanye West is canceled by a major corporation. This comes after his alleged anti-Semitic comments and wearing a White Lives Matter shirt. And in the NFL, a report claims that an embattled team owner has dug up dirt on the league commissioner, as well as some of the other owners. That and more coming up.
Attention Camp Lejeune employees. If you were a contractor or non-military employee who worked at Camp Lejeune, North Carolina prior to 1988 and developed any of these cancers or suffered any of these injuries, you may be eligible for significant financial compensation. Leaking underground tanks contaminated the drinking water with benzene and other highly carcinogenic chemicals. Call Camp Lejeune victims to discuss your case now. If you don't win, you pay nothing. 800-245-2189. Did you know dragging chains can spark a wildfire? Only you can prevent wildfires. Rapper Kanye West is in the news again. J.P. Morgan Chase has severed ties with the hip-hop artist. Candace Owens of The Daily Wire tweeted the notice that Chase sent Kanye. The bank writes that it will close Kanye West's accounts on November 22nd. It comes after West made alleged anti-Semitic comments on Instagram and wore a White Lives Matter shirt. According to The Daily Wire, West said he was happy to have crossed the line, so now he can talk about cancel culture. Owens says Chase Bank gave no official reason for closing Kanye's bank account. And turning to the drug crisis, prosecutors in New York said 300,000 rainbow fentanyl pills were seized at a house in the Bronx last week, along with another two, 22 pounds of powder fentanyl. That's the largest amount in the city's history. Officials said the drugs are worth about $9 million in street value. Two people have been arrested and charged in connection with the seizure. Fentanyl is a synthetic opioid that's highly addictive. It can be up to 50 times stronger than heroin and 100 times stronger than morphine, according to the CDC. The brightly colored fake pills look like some prescription drugs and even candy. And as Halloween nears, officials have been warning families to be especially vigilant. On the West Coast, California's Attorney General announced yesterday that 4 million fentanyl pills and nearly 900 pounds of fentanyl powder were seized in that state since April last year. And staying in California, non-citizens in certain cities can participate in state elections, but one lawyer is trying to stop that, citing the state's constitution. He says there are ethical reasons behind his actions, too. Several California cities have taken measures to allow non-citizens to vote in school board elections. In August, James Lacey, an attorney and political commentator, sued the city of Oakland for that kind of measure. He explains to California insiders C. Karami why it violates the California Constitution and Elections Code. When you stop and think about, well, all right, a person who is a non-citizen is certainly a citizen of somewhere else. Of another country. Of another yeah. country, right. And by not giving up that citizenship and seeking U.S. citizenship, what you're allowing to happen is individuals to come in who haven't professed an allegiance to this nation and who might be unwilling to give up citizenship in another nation that doesn't afford them the same democratic voting rights that we do. Back in March, Lacey sued and won the case against San Francisco that overturned the controversial law that allows non-citizens to vote in the city's local election. Four years ago, on the third or fourth attempt at a ballot initiative, progressives in San Francisco by 54 percent passed a law that allowed for non-citizens to vote in school board elections. The idea, underlying idea being to allow non-citizens who are parents of kids in schools to have some sort of a say in who was elected to their school board. The law had a sunset provision to extend it to be citywide. So when the Board of Supervisors voted to extend the law, Lacey was able to sue it within a 60-day window, challenging its constitutionality. So we went ahead and we filed uh, for what's called a writ of mandate uh, to um, 
have a permanent injunction on extending that vote. And our argument was that under a clear provision of the California Constitution, only citizens of the United States 18 years or older may vote. And it's, uh, it's alarming that this ballot initiative even got on the ballot and was allowed to have a vote. And it was a failure of the attorneys who advised the cities. Eventually, the judge ruled in favor of Lacey's argument and won. Lacey points out that in a close election where the outcome is decided by a handful of votes and non-citizens voted, the election would effectively be decided by their presence. He said it undermines the integrity of the entire voting process. And now, over to sports news. Here's NTD's Dave Martin with today's top stories. A bombshell report by ESPN alleges that Washington Commander's owner Daniel Snyder told an associate that he has enough dirt to, quote, blow up several other owners as well as NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell. Snyder's team, his employees, and his own conduct have been investigated by Congress, the Drug Enforcement Administration, as well as the NFL's office. The embattled owner has been accused of a toxic workplace, sexual harassment, and accounting misdeeds. Multiple owners and league executives told ESPN they'd like to see Snyder removed as owner. Snyder was fined $10 million a year ago as a result of the league's investigation into the team's workplace culture. In addition, he agreed to give up the day-to-day -day management of the commanders to his wife. Multiple owners, as well as league and team sources, told ESPN that Snyder has instructed his law firms to look into as many as six other owners, as well as the NFL's commissioner, though none would reveal how they learned that. A commander's spokesperson and outside lawyers have denied that Snyder ever hired or directed private investigators to track them. And in baseball news, Minnesota shortstop Carlos Correa has decided to opt out of his contract and become a free agent, according to Puerto Rican newspaper El Nueva Dia. The 28-year-old hit 22 home runs and drove in 64 runs in 136 games this year. Minnesota signed the two-time All-Star to a three-year contract worth $105 million just a year ago, but the deal included opt-outs after the first two seasons. And tonight in sports, Game 2 of the Yankees Guardians series has been postponed due to rain with the makeup date scheduled for Friday afternoon. Meanwhile, in the NFL, the Washington Commanders visit the Chicago Bears at 8.15 Eastern tonight. That's all for your sports news today. Back to you, Steph. Thanks, Dave. And that's all for today's news. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Stephanie Cox. Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.